Welcome to Before the Fire. You need to learn how to make it before you actually fire it. So we're going to talk about the figure and elements of the figure. I'm Professor Stephen Robison. I'm going to cover slump molding techniques and a little bit about hump molding too. I want you to review how to cut molds and everything in my previous demonstration for utilitarian purposes for the same technique. But you're going to need cardboard. I prefer a cardboard box so it lifts it up. Here's an example of some arm and leg ideas for the demonstration I'm going to show you. Um, you're going to use this cardboard mold to make these parts, and you have an A part and a B part, and they're going to come together like a clamshell. You can start looking at proportions in your drawings, and also once you've cut out that cardboard, you can see how you can adjust each element. You make them a little bit larger than you need, so you can cut stuff off. To further illustrate how to do the arms or the abdomen and the legs and the torso, I would lift the edges and then I'm going to slowly sled in here and push down into that negative space. Like Here's one side of the arm, this is the other side. I'll have to obviously do that twice on both to make two arms and those will come together. When I did the... Um, back of the legs I put a little piece here and I get under this to push up to do the back um, and into the glute, gluteus um, into the calf area I would push farther so you can think about that when you're coming into the bicep you can push more into the shoulder you can push more and these ideas of expansive techniques is what you're going to be thinking about expanding the clay you can look under the mold and see what you're doing. Uh, but as you flip it out, you'll be able to see what's happened and you can always put it back in the mold to do more. So here's the simplicity of like, you can see where um, maybe I can go then do, instead of expansive, I can compress down in and uh, I'll work this sh elbow a little bit, but all of this can be done after it's put together as a hollow piece. So this is just the arm element. Then we'll think about how to do the hand then attach that to the shoulder of the torso, and I'll show you some of that as we move. Okay, again, as you lift on the edges and push it in the mold, you can think about maybe where the pectoral muscles would be, and you can just use your thumb to push in there. If they're actually um, mammary glands or something a little larger, like a more muscular figure or um, a tougher shoulder or a weaker shoulder, that's where you start thinking about how much you would maybe push in the expansive uh, ways that you can push into the clay while it's hanging up in this mold. The other thing is like if you look at like where the neck would be, how much you push in with the neck compared to maybe where the chin would be, if I would like slowly push, you only have so much clay to push and you can push all the way through and that can be a problem. Um, you can add more clay. As I start looking at the interior, I can start looking at maybe how that chin is starting to come out there. I can also think about where the neck's coming in, and I can go in and I can push back. Um, if you look at metal smithing, there's a technique called chasing and repose, and that would be something to think about in terms of not just expansive. Okay, so you got these parts for your arms, the parts for your torso, the parts for your legs, and when you're thinking about putting them together, you have to put them together at a little bit wetter than leather hard, but it all depends on the size. Uh, then it's only if you want to manipulate them, um, if I want to bend it, and you'll see that in the finished piece. Your ideas uh, you can play with body parts. It doesn't have to be a full figure. What I've done is a seated figure, which is a little bit harder, uh, but with the scale, you could try it. Uh, and it's only about 12, 14 inches, uh, I would say, stick around there. Um, for the ideas around just elements, how do you put the um, piece into one piece with the study? So after you get them together, you're going to have additive work you could do like for the elbow there you're going to work the seams and smooth out those joints and you can start manipulating it then. so if you look at this one it's a little bit farther on down the line and 
I'm going to get a few more parts put together. I'm going to keep, if you notice down where the hand's going to attach, I'm going to keep that wet. I'm going to probably wrap these all up in plastic as I work. After I have all the elements together, then I'll start putting the whole figure together. As you see from the front side of the legs and the abdomen, um, I bent it, used clay to prop it up, and I did the opposite on where the the butt and the back of the legs are. So I'll let them stiffen up before I cut that final line, this line here, and uh, then I'll score and slip and put them together and readjust them so it will be more of a seated figure. Okay, as I'm working on this, I'm working the calves, I'm doing the feet, I'm working on these two parts now, putting the torso down onto the waist here so i've slowly cut more away i'll slow, score and slip that sometimes you want to reinforce things in there so i'm just getting this kind of proportion to be adjusted so i had a lot longer torso and a lot longer abdomen and i slowly cut more away until i felt like the proportions were closer I'll cut that off and i Tried to look at proportions of the arms, and I scored that and put that on there. Arms a little big, but I have it all somewhat melded together. Um, if you look at the the joints, they're all put kind of loosely together. I have the feet and the hands wrapped with wet paper towels, so they stay moist until I can get to them. I've mapped out the face. I didn't do any hair or anything. I just made a silly pinch pot for the head. <laughs> Um, if you're going to think about hair, it's going to be volumes off of there. I'm going to do a little more detailing and then work on the face, get on the hands and feet, and I'll show you the next steps. Okay, I'm going to start talking about some reductive techniques and sort of, um, you know, it's not always just reducing, but your needle tool could be a good way. This line here is what I'm going to work on around where the shorts are. And I'm going to push in and I'm going to rock. I don't know if you can see this right here. But I'm going to rock it. And I'm going to sled upward into the belly. And if you look at just that one little move, I've kind of used it like as a little earth mover, you know, and push some of that earth. Some of that clay has been removed. And so I can use my needle tool to start doing reductive work as I start defining the waistband on uh, his shorts here. So that could be um, one of the tools. Of course, if you reduce more, this piece, if you remember from the beginning of this demonstration, it was probably a quarter inch or less. So how much I remove with a loop tool, I could carve through it, and that could be a, a bad thing. You know, I could weaken a spot. So I'm trying not to remove too much. So there's deep relief carving and shallow relief carving, and these are two directions you need to think about. It's like, how much am I going to remove? I still am waiting to work on where the shorts come here. I'm going to probably add a thin slab to beefen up this area, and that's a different way rather than carving. So subtractive technique, this will be more additive and I'll do some folds in here as the shorts will probably come closer to the knee, uh, maybe halfway down the leg. Uh, I'm not gonna give it a shirt, I'm just gonna work on some nipples and do the underarms a little and work the clavicle area a little bit more. I'll work on the belly button and you know a little bit of beer drinking here. Uh, into that and really maybe define the tricep bicep area a little bit further too and that'll be the finishing stages along with working on the face features all the facial features eyes nose mouth and ears you did with the tile piece and hopefully that knowledge will pertain to any of this if you're going to challenge that I'm also going to work on a, like a rock where he's sitting rather than this um, temporary armature um, and may actually join this figure to that to that rock form 
And that'll be a, a real quick technique. I'll show you a real funny way to just, you know, oh, here's a rock, and I'll show you that. Okay, I got them pretty close to done here. Still working on the hands and the feet, the shoes. I made a little cigarette for them to smoke and a hammer to hold and a flower to hold. Okay, there's a variety of other things to think about with texture. I'm looking for some kind of rock texture. I'll just take a rock, rock it on the clay. And I can think about that texture um, for other things other than rocks too, right? So now we get this rock texture that's reminiscent of this big piece of granite. The other thing I talked about was I was going to make this figure just sitting on a rock. So I was going to talk about a hump mold with a found object. You can cover it with plastic, and that's what I'll do. I'll show you. That way the clay doesn't stick to whatever you're dropping it on. And then I'll show you how I just drop it on there just to get that form. Okay, so all I did was just put it in a plastic bag, and this is something so the plastic can peel off the clay really easily, you know. And if I just take that slab and I just drop it on there, I can create a form that's similar to that shape of that rock. I just kind of gently push it down around those edges. I may use the rock again to re-emboss some texture on the edge of this and I may not want this rock to be so big um, so I could cut it anywhere along here I'm getting that basic shape by again I'm just pressing it against the rock with that slab of clay you don't want to encapsulate it you want to be able to get it off there so you don't want to curve under any form um, so don't push around a form you could in a way do that and then cut it and then score it slip and put it back together but but i can do all of this kind of under uh underneath that rock that kind of shaping after i take it off so when to take it off is the question one thing you can think about is you know the wetness of the clay it'll say i'm ready when it doesn't deform this clay happens to be a little stiff. I might be able to just get it off. Remove the rock. Put that clay back on a board, preferably with some newspaper on it so it now doesn't stick to the board. So I'll put some newspaper on there. Now, if I'm going to push it down on there or do anything where I'm adding to that rock or that form I'm making, I can uh, push pretty pretty well down onto that board, get in there, um, and really get that form. So now this is a hollow form. It's about, let me rip some of this off, show you the thickness. So here's my finger next to that thickness. So again, it's about a quarter inch, and that'll allow me a little platform for that figure to sit on. So um, this is called hump molding. So you have this hump of a form that you use. In this particular case, it's a found object. I could do some hump molding with something that I create out of clay too. Um, if you look at the Malcolm Abuto Smith um, video I did of him working years ago in North Carolina, such a great artist. Um, I would like look towards there's a an, a time in one of the demos where he's working with a form underneath the form to create a shape now this is of course nothing new in the contemporary world if you look at all the mice and pieces uh, you look at how um, they were made on top of another clay form so they're held up we can talk about that further but all right so now i'm going to cut this edge away make this rock form, put the figure on it, and uh, finish up the shoes, and maybe work on the hands a little. The hands on this figure were really difficult because they're like the size of a dime.
you see by the scale of that sponge how small this figure is and it is hollow it's all really just difficult to work in this scale as it is to work in a larger scale so if you're working really small or working really large you're going to have issues with like details like the hands or little elements if you look at how small this little flower is he's holding for instance compared to my finger um that's kind of much more difficult than making a flower you know this big so uh you're going to think about scale for success you can push it and try and make something small i wouldn't go larger because of the limitations of how much clay you have right now but later on we can talk about larger scale formats all right so larger scale but see the head behind that, it's it's about three feet. Uh, this next part of this demonstration, I'm going to go a little larger, but I'm not going to go larger than life size. I'm going to go a little bit smaller than life size, and I'm going to just make an arm with a hand. All right, so I'm showing you this seam on this forearm. So this is like the top of the forearm. This is where the elbow would go. And I want you to make sure that you're really scoring and slipping and getting these seams together. And it's going to be all pinched on there. Yeah, and it's going to look sloppy. But then the next step would be to go back into that idea of sledding with your metal or flexible rib and smoothing that area out. And you can, you can work that joint. See how I'm working that joint? And it's slowly going away, okay? So you do want to make sure you get some good scoring and slipping going on. And you want to make sure that you uh, really pinch that area. And again, once you sled it, then again, I'm thinking like where this is going to attach to the bicep tricep area. And this area here will have an elbow. So it's more flat. And I'm going to, you're seeing it extra long because I'm going to cut some off to then add the hand. So that part there is almost fixed up this part again is what you want to do before you start sledding remember to really kind of squish that seam and you're just pinching the seam you don't need to pinch it up here just pinch that seam and really get that seam together and you can then slide with your finger also you don't necessarily need to use a rib but you can then sled really sledding around and what you're doing there is you're manipulating that joint clay when you manipulate that joint clay you get a stronger joint it's not going to crack on you um, so i'm just using my finger now and i'm not using the rib so slowly just slowly smoothing it out While I'm looking at the angle of the arm, I'm thinking about how much I cut off. You can see all these scraps here. I actually cut a little bit more than they're off, making your elements a little larger to be able to dissect them and remove stuff. So as I got into where the elbow comes in, I wanted to be able to cut that and figure out this angle of the arm. I've also left a bit extra here. Um, where I'll be cutting some and adding the hand also. But you can see that I've gotten from the inside, and I'll show you that. I'll lift this up and show you that with this hole here, I've been able to go in there and fix the joints and also push out a bit on where the bicep is. Where the bicep comes out of the shoulder here, I've been able to push in more and start forming that. I start thinking about where the tricep joins the shoulder I'm sticking really minimal with this. You can see by the scale of this one now, compared to this rib, that it's gonna be a little bit easier for me to then make the fingers. So once I've scored and slipped, I'm getting ready. I'm gonna probably wipe away a little of that slip just so there's not so much cleanup, but I'll pressure fit those and wiggle them back and forth till I get them together. And then I'll add a coil in that joint to meld from the outside to meld the forearm onto the tricep and bicep. So I like to use a, a wooden dowel or some kind of tool and I can, again, before I add a coil, you'll see me take some of the clay 
from this particular piece, the forearm, move it up onto the area where the forearm joins. And, and then, then I'll take this area and try and meld it more with a coil. But I do want the clay from these individual pieces to somehow get onto the other piece. And I, I don't want to use much water at all other than the, whatever water is from the slip that I've added to the scoring lines. But I want to be able to move it. So if there's water, it won't move. This is a, actually, it's an antler. Uh, but I'll work that side and then I'll, I'll show you the other side where it's not worked yet. So you see that joint where this is coming together right by the elbow. And I'll take this clay and I'll move that clay just on the surface. It's going to move some of the clay in the interior too, but just moving that clay. Again, these are about a quarter inch, a little more thick slabs. So you can look at the thickness of this slab. I can't move too much, but I want to move some of that clay from each piece. So I'm kind of cutting a little bit with this tool and manipulating that clay on. And again, I'm going to do this before I go and add a coil to, not just a coil to reinforce this joint, but a coil to try and manipulate it to where I want it visually. So it really looks as, as well as I can get with the idea around the anatomy of how this muscle kind of comes up, this comes down. We'll look, I'll look at that. How anatomically correct you are is not too relevant right now. Uh, sometimes it's not relevant at all. I think John michel Bisquet, um, a lot of artists out there really don't know anatomical um, correctness and they still make amazing figurative work. So we'll talk towards the reasons why you might go that direction are the reasons why you might stretch it out of there. If you stretch it out of there, if you look at Giacometti and other artists um, who use the figure, there's a lot of ways to abstract the figure. So we'll talk individually about that. All right, so I think you get the point of, of where you can go with these individual elements. And whether you do a full figure or whether you do some elements of a figure and work it into a piece, um, we'll talk about that individually too. You can see I've worked the areas of the forearm, worked into the elbow, um, also fixed up the joint where the bicep and tricep come into the forearm. And now I have the last thing to work on is keeping the hand wet because I'm going to Fix up that joint where I've added this hand. I have a thumb kind of going, and then I'll work on the fingers, and then that'll be finished. As I'm adding the thumb, I'm thinking about the, the proportions, and I start putting some details in. When I think about the some of the last details, I might put the fingernail in. Um, these are the tools I'm using again a curved piece of wood, or in this case, a piece of buffalo horn, and I'll put a fingernail in. Um, sometimes just by kind of figuring out where it is, embossing, rocking it like that. Yeah. I might then, you know, rock it on the front too to get the other part of the fingernail. Um, so I'm looking at these fatty tissues and if you look at your finger there's these these fat like kind of muscles that bend so that each joint gets a little narrower as you can see from that joint there. I'm also going to think about how to add um, small pieces like little balls of clay to accentuate each knuckle and pop that off. And I'll work um, 
I'll work the, work the fingernails and I'll work the knuckle joints and then I'll smooth it all out so it won't be sloppy like this. Um, so I'll be sledding with my fingers on my fingers. So the fingers in this case, um, if they, if it's a lot larger, I might make them the same way I made the forearm or something like that technique, but a little bit uh, nuanced with how you do smaller slops. Um, or but these fingers are, they're, they're actually smaller than my fingers. This is a smaller than life size hand here. And so they're just solid coils. So I'll just roll out a coil um, and then add it to, oops, add it to the area where the pinky is here or the other finger. So I'll just start adding these coils and I'll, so I'm keeping this moist and I'm going to score and slip and then join that and then manipulate all the rest of the fingers. Each time I'm going to get at least to the kind of the detail where this thumb is. Um, I'll like, for instance, in here, I notice that there's not enough. So I'll just keep that moist and I'll add um, the same as I'll add little balls of clay here and here for the knuckles. I'll add a little more down in here to fatten up that muscle that, that you see um, on my finger. So as they're straight, you don't see as much as they curve. You can see what I'm talking about. So it depends on the position if the hand is holding something you have to think about how the hand actually works. What, how many joints are there? It's really one, two, three. This is where I cut myself, so. But um, if you look at it, it's like one, two, three major ones that you have to think about where these kind of fatty or more muscle areas are. Okay, so that's what I'll be doing. I'll be working on all the details and I'll show you the next stage. Okay, I've got all the fingers on and I've got to do a lot of detailing, um, but you get the sense of where I'm going with this. This hand's going to, I can still actually, there's such wet coils that you see I can manipulate them. Um, so I don't want to obviously move them around too much and I don't want to do too many details on them right now. I'll smooth it out like I've smoothed out the rest of the arm and try and work some details into there and that'll be finished for this example. Make sure you go back to the first lecture on the figure and review some of the contemporary and historic figures. Get an idea of where you're going. Uh, pass on some drawings to me and let's discuss the direction you want to take with this assignment. Remember you have the option of doing um, elements of the body or a full figure. When looking towards anatomical correctness, if that is a direction you choose, you can again reference Gray's Anatomy and some other online resources that I'll expose you to to look at the muscle structure and understand what's under the skin a little before you start to model it. This drawing from Gray's Anatomy, you can see how the clavicle goes in and the neck muscles come up. Um, one of the things that you want to review is these details as you're doing the figure. Looking at where the arm joins, looking at the muscles coming up, and again the positioning of the way the leg is bent. Or if I'm looking at a hand that's open or closed, looking at those joints on each individual finger and how the thumb works is all part of your job in the study of these elements. If you go back and review the first presentation on the finger, I discussed how it's all around the world and it's been used since the beginning of humans to express ourselves and also to use it for utilitarian purposes. These are some drinking vessels from around the world. Kalima is another one from Peru. This is Costa Rica.
And again, anatomical correctness isn't a necessity. If you look at this one from the Mississippian culture in North America, you look at that weird ankle bone protruding out from there. Or how car kind of cartoony this one is. Here's one from China. It's another Neolithic from China. So as you look at how they're stylized, how we look at the foot is going to be interpreted in a variety of ways. And in all of these, you see sometimes some kind of binding or some kind of sandal or some kind of ideas around the shoe. And the full figure, again, that's seen everywhere. These were two great figures found in the tomb of Princess of Canossa. My son and I were looking at it at the Louvre in Paris. Della Robbia. So many figures from there. A lot of times relief pieces or deep relief pieces like this one. And as we get into contemporary work, there's a shoe of Jason Briggs. This is an Akio Takamori. This is another Akio Takamori. And we look into how the figures can be set up to be allegories. In this work, these small figures are brought from a historic period, but also talk about contemporary issues. This piece is Claire Partington is in the Portland Art Museum. Around the department, you might see a piece by Ted Vogel. This is in our permanent collection. You see the element, the hand, the head is turned into a tree. This is a Dirk Stashky. And Sergei Isipov is one of my favorites. I have so many favorite um, figurative artists in the ceramic world. These are all actually teapots. And if you look at how other people work, I can't overstress the importance of the variety of different ways to work with the figure. And if you look at the techniques, I'll go over some basic stuff. He did a demonstration for my students years ago. He's a good friend of mine, lives in Massachusetts now. Um, but you can see how he's working with slabs in a similar way that, that I'm working with these slump molded elements. When you get into looking at the details, it's all the same thing. Uh, the scale of this one is a little more difficult for you to manage. And if you look at the foot here, he's working on how small those toes are, or the hand that's in his hand there. All the details that you get to think about can be real challenging if you need any help as you're experiencing any problems with uh, the fingers or the toes or an element that you're working on please communicate with me about what you might need this is the finished piece of that demonstration that I just went over Sergei Isipov is one of the top figurative artists in the world and there are so many others for you to be influenced by. As you do your research, I'll be able to see where you want to go with your work. Most important thing is to have fun. And just make sure you communicate with me at all times if you need any help. Okay, dive right in.